Jeremy Zimmerman, we know you from the Cypherpunk, so the World Tomorrow series. You've been a close friend uh, of Julian, I, I imagine, and you're one of those people that knows a lot about computers, but I remember from that series that you had some very, you had a philosophy as well. What you said there was, was really important. I'm Julian Assange. Roger, I'll get you into strength. Editor of WikiLeaks, we've exposed the world's secrets. A furious war over the future of our societies is underway. The most, this war is invisible. On the one side, a network of governments and corporations that spy on everything we do. On the other, the cypherpunks, virtuoso geek activists who make codes and shake public policy. This is the movement which spawned WikiLeaks. I am joined by three cypherpunk friends. From Germany, Andy Muller Magoon. From France, Jeremy Zimmerman. And from the United States, Jake Applebaum. I want to ask them, is the future of the world the future of the internet? How do you feel about what's going on at the moment? Well, thanks for uh, the interview. This whole trial is a, a tragic farce. It's a parody of justice. None of this is real. None of this is true. None of this illegal. From the beginning on, everything that happened in the UK, in the US, in Sweden, in Ecuador, has been illegal. Everything has been extraordinary and illegal. So what we see here is this painful attempt at giving a legitimacy to a decision that almost seems written already. This court is, is, is well, calling it a kangaroo court would be an insult to kangaroos, actually. This building is the most oppressive architecture one can imagine. To get in there, you feel like you're going to be in prison yourself, like you're being the subject. I don't even want to enter the, the courtroom itself because I've been there in 2012 and I know how horrible it is to be in the public gallery. You cannot even hear anything. So I hear that the, the defense is making fantastic arguments. Like every point they're making would justify in itself that the whole court be dropped and that UK would apologize while crying to Julian Assange about what they're doing to him. If I'm here, is to be with you, with the fantastic people from all over the world who are here to show support, to show solidarity, and to show to the world that we don't believe in that shit, but that we are writing by yourself. What is the actual history? What is his story? Which is what we want the world to remember. Yeah. And as you said, what the world should be remembering today is not about him. Well, it is about him, and it is about how tragic his condition is. It is how, about his being brutally tortured and repressed by all the, the refined techniques that brutal states have to oppress people. It is about this indeed. But it is also about Julian's contributions to the world, about what it means to create WikiLeaks, about what WikiLeaks means for you, for me, for everyone around. And you mentioned that uh, briefly in your introduction. WikiLeaks was and is still this uh, encounter between the, the ethical hackers, the people who invent technology for greater good, the people of free software, the people who understand computers, but computers with a philosophy. The meeting of them and the people who believe in true journalism, in journalism that investigates, in journalism that verifies information, in journalism that attempts to put out there information that the world needs to see. This meeting between the two is WikiLeaks. It is, to this day, a, a symbol of what journalism must be if we want journalism to support truth, to support freedom, and to support democracy. So beyond Julian and his tragic destiny, beyond what may happen to him if he ever sets foot in the US, where he faces 175 years in jail, or worse, beyond what's gonna happen to everyone who may or may not have participated one day into any of these alleged harming of the US 
a theft of cyber weapon, meddling with election, or any fantasy charges that are being put together against him. Beyond all this, it is the fate of truth, the fate of the, the potentiality for technology to help us collectively bring about the truth. And it is about ultimately our relationship to power, yep. our relationship to the crimes, to the lies, and mm. to the wars that are being waged in our name. Yes. So a lot of people say, I mean, Ray McGovern, for example, William Binney, say that the, it was the Vault 7 release that really uh, changed things. Obama decided not to pursue a prosecution because there would be the New York Times problem that there would be other journalists who published the same material first, in fact. But it seems to me that the real story with Vault 7 was about the CIA not actually telling the software manufacturers about these uh, vulnerabilities and, and that they made us l less secure um, instead of more secure. What do you think about the, the ethical behavior or the unethical behavior of the CIA? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the real story well, the, behind uh, Vault 7? Uh, uh, with a little bit of irony, one could say that the, the, the CIA has been created for the sole purpose of doing unethical things. Yeah. Uh, Vault 7 is a surprisingly unreported uh, release by WikiLeaks, yeah. uh, but one of major importance yeah. in how much it uh, enables to understand the world we live in. Yeah. Uh, we're living in a, in a world that is increasingly computerized, where those tiny bits holding in your hands are doing about everything, they're cheap, they're yeah. ubiquitous, some speak of the internet of things and such things. But few people realize uh, the complexity of these systems. And few people realize how the complexity of these systems very often uh, exists by design to act against the user of the device. How this complexity is somehow instrumentalized against us. The fact that we cannot remove a battery from a device just enables Google and the other to collect more data yeah. from us than if we could from time to time remove the, the battery from it. But that's just one example out of many. What we've seen already with the, the Snowden documents, let's not open a parenthesis here, but how many of the Snowden documents have we seen? Yeah. There was a stash of 100,000, and recently The Intercept closed the Snowden archive. We've seen a few hundred slides, and Snowden appears as the good boy, the responsible one. Give us the docs! Well, he... you know? That was just a parenthesis. What we've learned from the Snowden docs and from Vault 7 is that the complexity of this computer system, their vulnerabilities, have been weaponized. Yes have been used by the states against the states, by the states against the people, by the st states against the corporation. Mm. And what we've seen is that we should all now sit in a profound distrust of any computer system that is around. Mm -hmm. That is a tragic realization. Mm. But at the same time, it could enable us to rethink trust, to rethink computing, to rethink a relationship to these machines mm -hmm. and what we want to be doing with that. Mm -hmm. Vault 7 is of primary importance. Yes. But another of these information that was grossly underreported mm -hmm. is that not only the CIA has the capacity to penetrate about any computer, any smartphone, any uh, Samsung smart TV, whatever, toaster, smart appliance, smart fridge, uh, you, you name it. But also while doing so, they're capable of leaving traces that make it look like the Russians did it. Marble framework. Marble framework, you know. And once you've understood that, maybe you look at US politics from a different angle. Maybe the whole craze of, oh, blame Russia. Russia is under every stone, on every tree, under every crime, under every vote, and so on. You know, maybe this helps you take a distance to these things. Yeah. So once again, we see that Vault 7, it's not, a, it's not the scoop. Yeah. It's not what you can tell about it during the day. Mm. It's what, after months and years of digging, dwelling, uh, uh, collating, documents, researching, putting things together in order to, 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 to make sense mm. of it, mm. in order to, to actually uh, build knowledge out of the information. Yeah. That's when doing this, 
that we can build a better understanding of the world. And it's not a thing for journalists only, mm -hmm. not for people with a press card who may have the privilege to go and enter a prison cell of the, the, the whatever crown court of whatever. Uh, no, it's not just for real journalists. Yeah. It's for everyone. Mm. Everyone who is interested in participating in journalistic activities. Mm. Everyone who is interested in researching the, the, the world mm. and explaining to their next of kin. Mm. Everybody who is interested in, in history. Mm. Everybody who is interested in art mm. and writing fiction mm. out of it. So what Wikileaks brought to the world is also this capacity to, to break the, 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 the mirror somehow mm -hmm. between what is a journalist and this capacity we all have, we all felt we had yeah. while we were nurturing this dream of a free internet mm. that would enable us. Yeah. And, and Wikileaks is, is a, for that reason, a formidable tool of collective empowerment. Mm. And what it means is precisely what the governments of this world are probably shit scared. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why they're applying such brutality on a friend over here and all he's ever said and done and all he's ever stood for. Mm. Yeah, Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee called for a Magna Carta for the web. If you were to uh, contribute to that, what uh, would you add? Would well, it be something about what's allowed to be done with our data, for example? First of all, I'm sorry, but what we're witnessing here means that Magna Carta is being used as toilet paper by these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, these people are so powerful that they can afford any time, excuse my language, but to really wipe their ass with Magna Carta. Yeah. So what we need should be much more yeah. fascist proof mm -hmm. than Magna Carta anyways. And then Tim Berners-Lee and his World Wide Web, that's great, great technology. Have you seen what the web looks like today? Mm. Have you used the web without an ad blocker, a JavaScript blocker, a this and this and this blocker? We let the web turn into a, a, a bloody trash. Yeah, yeah. And we've lost control yeah. of so much of this technology mm. around mm. The, 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 the years. Mm. Ten mm. years ago, when, we were, when WikiLeaks was releasing collateral murder, the Iraq warlocks, the Afghan warlocks, Cablegate, that changed the face of the world, that changed our understanding of the world. Yeah. We were still believing genuinely in this dream of a free internet. Yes. What is left of it today? But I tell you, not only this big release, but also when Google met WikiLeaks. Yeah. Eric Schmidt. Again, Assange and WikiLeaks helping us understand what's going on. Mm, mm. If you take together those major releases and the few Snowden documents we have access to, and uh, Vault 7, and when Google meet WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks and the spy files, you actually get so much more of an explanation mm -hmm. of what happened to technology yeah. and what happened to our uh, a dream Mm. of a free internet yeah. and precisely how those companies and those governments broke our dream yeah. for the sole purpose of increasing their profits and increasing their power. Yeah. So what do you think about intelligence companies getting involved in political elections? <laughs> what do you think about the use of that data to manipulate the what, most vulnerable among us? What can one think? Tell me, look me in the eyes. Discrimination? <laughs> what can one think yeah. about abusing people, about abusing their, 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 their credulity, about abusing their, 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 their attraction to machine, about uh, abusing their addiction to mm. the interface of their yeah. social media, yeah. uh, about their desire to, to compensate their isolation mm -hmm. with the attention mm. uh, that, that you, you appear to, to, to get yeah. from yeah. using these technologies. Yes. What do we think of billionaires abusing that? Wow. Really? You, 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 know, you know as well as I do the answer. This is intolerable. Mm. This is not democracy anymore. Mm. These elections are not free. Yes. I when know. the one with the more money is capable of buying the election, mm. then mm. What, what is left? Oh, of yes. democracy. I know. One, one has to wonder if one's thoughts are our own anymore. <laughs> well, so ha is it still possible to stay safe online, Jeremy, do you think? I don't think, I think back in the cypherpunks you were saying it's really, there's no guarantee. 
Yeah. So, uh, are, are uh, there any well, refuges? I would say, uh, but it's an answer of a... <laughs> it's almost the answer of a computer security expert, which I'm not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I would tell you that the answer would be that it depends on what you mean by safe. Yes. And against whom you're trying to be safe. Yeah. I will answer differently uh, is that in so many ways and by so many means, mm. uh, the best way to feel safe maybe uh, mentally yeah. is to be sure to spend some time offline. Yes. You know, whether you're organizing something, you don't want others to know, whether you want to share intimate details about yourself, yeah. Yeah. whether you want to elaborate hypotheses or write uh, something you're not sure about or whatever you want to, to, to do, yeah. maybe better stay offline. Yeah. So I, I wish, I wish that somehow after the, the peak of techno optimism, you know, about the, the dream that was sold by Wired and the Californians, that technology would magically in one click solve everything. Yeah. Uh, we'd come back maybe to sense somehow mm -hmm. that we'll share ways of breaking the addiction to Twitter, to Facebook, yeah. that we'll share ways to understand the, the depth of the, the architectural totalitarianism of Google, yeah. Yeah. that we'll learn the, 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 the profound oppressive nature of so many patterns of computer architecture these days yeah. and so eventually we will somehow uh, relearn the value of offline yeah. and collectively learn how to practice offline yeah. when you say let's let the, the dominant oh, actors uh, mm. decide what the policy will be I can answer you from the perspective of what was the internet in the last 15 years, where innovation was so-called uh, bottom-up, where um, mm. uh, new practices emerged out of nothing, where uh, a couple of guys in a garage um, invented a technology that spread like... Uh, for, for, nearly, for nearly everything, for, so for Apple, for, for you, Google, for you, everything, YouTube. For everything, everything that happened on the internet mm. just boomed after being unknown a few months or few, few years before. So you cannot predict what will be the next innovation. My point here is that it's a policy has to adapt to society and not the other way around. We have the impression with the copyright wars that legislator tries to make the, the whole society change to adapt to a framework that is defined by Hollywood. Say, okay, uh, what you're doing when you're with your new cultural practice is just morally wrong. So if you don't want to stop it, then we'll design legal tools to make you stop doing what you think is good. This is not the way to make good policy. So I'm convinced that when you enable the, the most powerful industrial actors to decide what policy should be, you don't go that way. As a conclusion, I think Bush, Blair, Johnson, uh, Putin, Trump should be in that hell of a place as the war criminals they are. But Julian Assange should be free, free as a bird, free as the air, and we're all working together to make this happen. Yes, we are.